Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Small Data with T, where we are passionate about the power of small data in healthcare. I am your host, Tanasia Gonzalez, but you can call me T. Data has certainly changed the game in healthcare. Big data has blown the roof off, but small data, now that's the future. Small data allows us to dive deep into the key insights and take quick, customized action to achieve phenomenal results in performance and quality improvement. Let's explore this today. Thanks so much for joining us. If you have any questions for me or any of my guests, feel free to reach out to me at tgonzalez at eima-inc.com. Enjoy the show. Let's go. Welcome, everyone, to Let's Talk Small Data with T. I'm happy to have you today on this live roundtable discussion about keeping small data and big data secure. Um, over the past few months, I've been talking to many folks all around the globe about how they're leveraging their small data as well as their big data and their various systems to do some phenomenal projects around quality improvement and really changing lives in a very uh, deep and positive way. Um, and of course, we always have the subject of, okay, how exactly are we securing the data? Um, and it's not about the technology that we employ always. It's, it's, it's about how we as the humans are ensuring that the patient data that we now have in our hands is kept safe and secure and used for the purpose that it's supposed to be used for. The three individuals joining me tonight for our live roundtable discussion are experienced and super passionate about this subject, and they are ready to share their expertise with us tonight. So I really hope you enjoy this talk. I'm really excited to talk with them. And during the talk tonight, feel free to ask questions. During the talk, you can either um, put that in the chat box and we have someone managing the chat box and saying the question for you, or you can pop on and ask the question yourself. Uh, just let us know what you would like. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce my panelists. I'm gonna go ahead and ask you all to join me, uh, starting with Ron Tomo. I will allow you to be a panelist along with me. I ask you to share your camera with us so we can see your face. Um, just start your camera for me and turn yourself off of mute. Apologies for that uh, to the attendees. Thank you so much for joining me again. On the line, we do have Ron Tomo. Um, he is a Emma, the Emma Advisory Board Chair. He's a VP and he's a CIO. And he's an author, he's an IT professional. He's a communication, communication specialist with the US Army, which I think is pretty cool. And he's an entrepreneur. So Ron Tomo, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm very happy to be here, T. Thank you, welcome to the show. And I can't wait until I can actually see your face. <laughs> Apologies for the technical difficulties. That's definitely my fault. Usually it's the user that's at fault and it's my fault tonight. So apologies to everyone, but uh, we're trying to get that fixed now. Um, next up, we have Victoria Huff. She's the founder and CEO of the Happy Executive Inc. She's an author. She's a digital strategist. She's also a business coach and an executive coach and an entrepreneur. Victoria, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, T. Thank you. And again, I wish I could see your beautiful face, but thank you so much for being here in your essence. Um, really looking forward to hearing more about uh, your expertise in the area and your thoughts in the area. Last up, we have Matt Webster. Currently, he's a CISO at Galloway Holdings. He's also an author. Um, he's a highly experienced cybersecurity leader. He's a speaker, and he has a recently published book that is on pre-order right now called Do No Harm, Protecting Connected Med Medical Devices, Healthcare, and Data from Hackers and Adversarial Nation. Na uh, congratulations. Hopefully I got that right, Matt. Thank Welcome you. to the show. And congratulations on the new book. I, I see that the uh, the book is on, is on pre-order. Uh, on Amazon. So as I said, all three of my guests are awesome. They rock and they're all authors. And after the show, you will receive an email 
that gives you links to all of the um, information for each of my guests. So you can see their books and all of their work. Um, so thank you everyone and welcome to the show. Um, I feel like let's, uh, Daniela, any luck on the video? So I made a switch in the back end. So please okay. have all of the panelists try the camera now. Okay, you could try now. Beautiful, there you are. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. hello. It's so nice <laughs> to see you. Thank you so much for your patience and hanging in there with me and us and Daniela, you rock. Um, if I haven't told you like a hundred times, you're a rock star. Um, thank you very much. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get the discussion started. So, you know, we've had a lot of pre-talks before talking about this subject and talking about small data and cybersecurity, and that sounds very big data-ish, but we know that small data is in there somewhere. So we wanna have some discussion about exactly what is necessary to keep the small data safe? So first question on the agenda is how is cybersecurity applied to small data? So, you know, this is an open round table. I'll just put it out there. Whoever wants to jump in on that, go ahead. Let's give it about 10 minutes or so. Who would like to start? Well, I'd like to uh, just open up with uh, this particular one because this is okay. very interesting to me. Okay. Um, Small data has been around for a very long time and the problems that exist with securing it, if you view cybersecurity as the, from the perspective of securing everything and big data is often handled with uh, very high tech, uh, uh, you know, protocols and algorithms and all kinds of very fancy stuff, which mm -hmm. I'm sure Matt is very much involved in. Um, but, um, Small data presents a, a bigger problem. And I think I would just like to share a couple of things that occurred that should be of interest as to why it becomes so critical to protect the small data. These are both real life experiences that uh, happened in my career. Um, I remember one uh, in one place where I worked, there was a situation where people were actually taking the newborn list and selling it. Uh, now that was on paper and <laughs> it was a report yeah. that came out every day. Now the, it leads you to something that becomes more critical in many respects compared to technology, because mm -hmm. this is not a technological problem. This is a personnel problem and a human yeah. resources problem. So, and then another item on the same vein was a situation where they were taking the cardiac patients who had, uh, who had recently had surgery and they were selling those names to drug companies. So um, controlling the data becomes critical. And part of the way I look at it is that we have to basically train the users and the people that are getting this data, whether it's in a spreadsheet, whether it's in a PowerPoint, whether it's on paper, mm -hmm. they have to understand what the policies and procedures are and be trained in it. So. Um, it's very important and it's a different kind of uh, security. Okay. Um, fair enough. Sounds scary as I'm listening to the stories, but yeah, these things do happen and usually it's the people and the, the picture that need to be addressed. Matt, Victoria, anything to add with, uh, to what Ron uh, just said? Yeah, I mean, to your point, it's about the people, the process, and the technology. As Ron pointed out, sometimes you can't use a technological solution for that. You know, if you have a piece of paper and somebody's just put it in their pocket, you're never going to know. I mean, you could create a process, you know, where you examine every single person who walks out the door, but is that really reasonable to the rest? Probably not. Like and a search so, and frisk. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it's, it's not reasonable. So what's reasonable in a situation like this? Doing a background check on somebody and doing recurring background checks every three or five years, depending on the sensitivity of the data, mm -hmm. that's more important. So if they've committed fraud someplace, then you can say that there's a risk of fraud as a result of that person working at this organization. So you've got to look at these things in, in its entirety. Um, mm -hmm. What do you watch out for? What are you paying attention to? You know, maybe somebody saw this person taking the data, but they didn't think anything of it. You know, so they put it in their pocket and walk out. 
but maybe somebody doesn't know how to report an incident or what, how do you identify yeah. those incidents. So it's about creating a reasonable control and a reasonable mechanism for people to work around these types of challenges. Right. Um, and also uh, kind of a, a culture like if you see something, say something kind of thing, right? Um, everyone's got to have eyes and skin in the game um, so that everyone's looking out at the same time. And it's also, they, by the way, um, mm -hmm. very important that there are actual policies that mm -hmm. are set up in HR because to protect the organization, you know, you, you, you will have a problem if obviously they steal data or, or it gets lost or whatever happens to it, you have a problem. But you'll have less of a problem if mm -hmm. you have policies in place that basically point out to everyone that this right. is what the, the the organization stands for. This is what we do, right. and this is the penalty for anybody who does this. That it makes it better for you as a company. Right. I mean, that, as the organization, like um, you have to be very aware of like uh, the financial uh, penalties as well. Right? Could be quite substantial. If yes. you're not, you know, monitoring and, and managing things properly on your side. So very interesting. Okay. Any other thoughts around um, cybersecurity and how it's applied to smoke? Victoria. Hello. Oh, I just have, I hi, see you. I, I just wanted to just reiterate what you said about culture and uh, certainly, you know, just hiring them in you know, having full disclosure as far as what's tolerated versus uh, zero tolerance. And right. I'd like to believe that, you know, with with how uh, how we've advanced and like Matt and Ron were saying and you about background checks and, you know, just hiring the right people, because if we're really good up front with identifying the people that will fit into our culture, mm -hmm. then we're certainly not going to with people that would steal and sacrifice integrity right but it's a, it's a little something i don't want to say but just evil to say you know oh i've seen that you did this bad thing over here so i'm going to assume that you're going to do this over right. here as well i mean like you kind of put like a a flag on the person i guess and just <laughs> put them in a bucket and saying okay we're going to let you in but you're going to be on the uh the close watch uh, list or something like that. And I know it's important to put in policies and procedures, but very important to put in mechanisms to track and measure how well people are following those policies and procedures. Um, and it's really hard to do, especially when you have random thumb drives and uh, papers that people are just scribbling things down on and, and what have you. Um, and yeah, I mean, so good points. Were so you going to say From something? my perspective as well, yes. You know, when you're talking about culture, that's really important. Mm -hmm. So if you take something like the Enterprise Strategy Group, they have a fantastic model called the Security Maturity Model. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. Everybody can read it. It shows executives, but shows what are some key characteristics of a mature security model within an organization. But there's a lot of things you can do to measure, you know, security and take mm -hmm. a look at culture. You can put out questionnaires and see how people respond. And if you make them anonymous, you're going to get a more true response than if you have to tie somebody's name to it. Because right. They're going to want to put some things in there. But there's a lot of things that you can do from a cultural standpoint to imbue a culture of security within an organization. And it starts up at the very top. I mean, the CEOs have to be involved in it, the board mm -hmm. of directors. Everything is tied together into a big picture. And to right. me, that's what's very important. If the Board of directors doesn't care. There's some organizations when they take over, the board of directors doesn't care. They're trying to, you know, sell off the company. They're going to drop security. In other cases, they care very much if they want to create a legacy and they're trying to establish a culture. Sometimes right. their security is going to be very important and all depends on all these different factors. If, right. you're, if you're a CEO and your board of directors says security needs to be top priority, you need to do X, Y, and Z that's going to create a very different culture and it's going to have a ripple down effect throughout everybody else. Right. Some companies want to discount that or some people discount that, but if you don't start at the very top, you're going to run into problems all the way through the organization. You know, mm -hmm. and there are certain ripples because some organizations have, you know, they're great over here, but mm -hmm. maybe poor over in this other area, but it's all about creating that communication, that open process and making sure that security is prioritized 
prioritized right. throughout the whole organization. Interesting. Yeah. So it's like, you no, know, definitely the message starting right from the top and everyone in the company knowing and being very much aware of that message and one voice, one message throughout and um, different uh, policies and, and things in place to, to really track and measure if people are on board with that or not. Um, so great points. Thank you. Um, so unstructured data, you know, I hear this a lot. What exactly is unstructured data? Because I know it's something very important and it's something really hard to protect, but I think it's really important to this discussion as well. Um, go ahead. Anybody can jump in on that one. I think it's important to talk about what's the difference between what is structured versus unstructured data. Right, right, right. Structured yeah. data is something that's going to sit in something called a database. So in that case, you've got a structure. Here's your name, address, phone number, medical record number, you know, et cetera. They've got very strong structures for where right. all that data should be sitting. That is referred to as structured data. Okay. What okay. Ron was talking about <clears throat> is also related to unstructured data. So hospitals, for example, if you read the data breach investigation report um, by Verizon, I'm a big fan of it, and take a look at what the key issues are, there's a lot of different types of issues, and a lot of it has to do with misdelivery. Um, sometimes that's going to be a physical mailing, sometimes that's email, you know, and, and there you've got, hey, like an email, for example, maybe we need a process where we validate what we're doing and making sure that we don't send the data to the wrong people because that's right. a HIPAA violation right there. Yes. You know, if a nurse within a hospital, a second one reads it and goes, oh, okay, oops, I happen to see John Doe rather than Jane Doe, that's not really a HIPAA concern because right. things like that happen, it's not a big deal. But if you send it to uh, give John Doe's information to Jane Doe and they aren't part of the hospital system, they're patients, that's mm -hmm. where you've got a problem. So in that case, you'd want to create a better QA process. Now, there's some technologies right. you can use that can pull back that in order to limit the exposure. Right. But for the most part, that's where the risks really come in um, from an unstructured data. The challenges with unstructured data, as Ron pointed out, it can be absolutely anywhere. <clears throat> you can have it in your email, of course, but it could be sitting on an Excel spreadsheet. It could be the piece of paper, you know, et cetera. So how do you secure each one of those things? You have to really sit down and think about what are the processes. Do you have security awareness training? I mean, that's a really key thing right there. And making sure that you follow that process and making sure people are aware, hey, it's an incident, how do we report it? So you end up right. with these kind of ABCs of unstructured data that need to be followed. But sometimes you need to have that. So let's say if you've got a uh, HIPAA analyst and they're trying to see what kind of access people have, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to tie that into data, well, that's a very good review to do. So you might say, huh, let's, let's go ahead and take a look at it. That's part of something called data governance to mm -hmm. map the data to the people, but it's also access management, uh, identity governance from that right. process. And those two match together to be to form data governance, but you're looking at that going, huh, sometimes you need to see the data in order to validate that. Other times you're gonna use a tool. It right. all depends on what's going on and how things are structured within that organization. So when right. you talk about unstructured data, you're gonna talk about email. Maybe you've got some data loss prevention tools on the email system Right. It will stop email from going out, but quite often you need to have that going out. Um, maybe it's something simple, like you've got a web page. So, you know, there's a small amount of data that should be going into that. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to take a look but, at all of these different avenues for yeah. where that data is going. And sometimes it's a little tiny bit of data, mm -hmm. but and sometimes it's structured, sometimes it isn't. It depends right. on a lot of different factors. But right. those are some of the key things to pay attention to. It's looking at cybersecurity very holistically and right. making sure that you cover every single angle you can think of. You know, somebody right. steals a laptop, how much of an issue is it? One of the old <clears throat> issues is like the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary mm -hmm. would find $1.5 million for a last laptop. Mm. I think um, also Ron. that there, there is a situation that comes up, which, which most people don't think about much. But you do have scenarios where structured data ends up becoming unstructured data. And that's a real big problem because what happens is uh, we'll make up something that we put in say an access database or we put it into a spreadsheet or we put it into you know whatever electronic form. It's totally structured. Then what happens is we hand that to a user. Mm -hmm. and 
takes it, all right, and proceeds to now take stuff out, uh, perhaps cutting and pasting things, uh, sometimes making mistakes. Now, all of a sudden, your structured data, which was very controlled when it was given to the user, uh, all of a sudden becomes an unstructured set of data, which also can cause audit exceptions. It's a very serious problem because if I'm producing as the IT, you know, the CIO, and I'm producing what's necessary for a given, um, be it a financial uh, report, a statistical analysis going to the state or the federal mm -hmm. government, I'm the official holder of the statistics because I'm the one that's dealing with the big data and everything else. Mm -hmm. But what happens many times is that people take a subset or a small data set mm -hmm. and do stuff to it. Now, all of a sudden, you have a problem because the small data no longer matches the big data. That's an audit exception, and that's a really big problem. And so it's been tremendous detached. financial loss. Yeah, it's been detached from mothership, so to yes. speak. Yes. Once um, it leaves, yeah, once it leaves the mothership, then it becomes a problem because there are too many people touching it that are doing stuff to it. And whether they're putting it on a website, whether they're putting it in a report, it doesn't matter if they take a, a very structured data set, change it and put it in a report to an agency of some kind right. and conflicts with the reports that I would have produced at the IT department, uh, that's a major audit exception and a big problem. Okay. Expensive one, by the way. Yeah. So that's what that, that financial stuff I was talking about. And it's like, Matt, when you were talking about the processes and everything set up, there's got to be like a reporting mechanism in there. If you see something, say something and, and not feel like you're going to be penalized. Um, that's a big one. I guess that goes back to Victoria, your, 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 your heart, the people, you know, the, the persons working in the culture. You know, um, if I report this, if I see Johnny over there doing something that looks a little funky and this data is going to go rogue, um, can I say something without getting beat up in the parking lot or something like that? You know, just <laughs> uh, not feeling like you'll be retaliated against, you know. Um, another thing um, I was going to say, like, I've worked in situations where there are so many mechanisms in place to protect the data that it prohibits me from doing my work um, in the best way that I know how in my skill set. You know, I mean, it's like once you're within your server or your world, so to speak, I don't know what you would call it. IT guys help me out with the terminology. Um, but, you know, where you have everything on the secure server, it's secure. I'm doing everything inside our walls. Why can't I take the data from one system to another, even if it's from the EMR right into an access database, right into an Excel, right into a Word, as long as I'm staying within our walls. I have been places where it's like, nope, they don't even allow you to do that. And it's like, okay, now I can't even do my work. Um, they're, worried, so I guess, uh, they're worried about the fact that the data becomes out of sync. Yeah. That's why we don't, the IT people do not like duplications of data. Right. Because the moment it gets duplicated, it becomes out of sync. Mm -hmm. And once it's out of sync, now you have a really big problem because yeah. now you have, for example, you can have an EMR that says one thing in one database and in another database somewhere else, even within the same confines of a given firewalls or whatever in a given agency right. or, you know, a, a hospital, you still have a serious problem mm -hmm. because now the data is no longer in sync and that's a that's really bad. And that's actually dangerous. That's dangerous, both, both from a patient care standpoint mm -hmm. and equally a huge financial problem. Huge. Yeah. So you gotta be careful with all this stuff. It was really, to tell you the truth, I mean, I lived through all this, all right? So I came from the days where basically users couldn't touch anything. If it didn't come from me, they didn't get it. And so, you know, then all of a sudden I was there when we went over to spreadsheets and we went over to, you know, everything else. And now all of a sudden users, users had access and were holding and in control of all this stuff. Right. And it created so many headaches, right, to deal with. And so many things became out of sync and, and, and stuff. It became a real problem, which of course then required the policies, procedures, all kinds of things were put in place. But at the end of the day, it still happens. 
and it's yeah. a real problem. Okay. So, to look at exactly to Ron's point, but from a little bit more of a cybersecurity angle, it's about centralization versus distribution. Okay. So, mm -hmm. for example, on the database, you can encrypt each database. Yeah. So you can use something called FIPS 140 2 to make sure that it's as secure as you possibly can get. Right. And there's some other tricks out there you can you can use as well. But uh, if you have a distributed model where everybody's downloading data and playing with it in 50 different areas or a thousand different areas, right? <clears throat> all it takes is one of those computers to be lost, and all of a sudden you potentially have a HIPAA violation. Well, so you're going to make sure that you encrypt it, you know, and all of these right. other things. And if you and if you have it distributed, then you got to find a way to encrypt all those. Now there are some solutions out there that can help to <clears throat> encrypt all that data, but that mm -hmm. becomes a bigger challenge for the organization and mm -hmm. just a greater chance that something could get out there. Right. So like there's a tool type called data loss prevention, and this is all over the place because now okay. you have it in cloud. Like in the old days, yeah, we had it maybe the mainframe and you know somebody would access it remotely and it was pretty simple. But now you've got cloud environments. Oh, I want to put it in my version of Dropbox or Box or some of these other tools. Yeah. Or, hey, well, Google this is Drive. our corporate version versus your corporate version. We use yeah. Box, they use Dropbox. <clears throat> and it opens up all of these different areas. So now if you lose a right. phone, you know, and it's got data in it because you emailed yourself because you wanted to work with something in IT or go validate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. That becomes yet another place where that data can be taken. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about small data, um, when you talk about unstructured data, it's all over and that, that's it's all over the place you can't localize it you need more and more unique types of dlp so you need more and more security solutions to monitor in those particular environments right and it re requires greater trust so if you've got a third party you're sharing data with and mm -hmm. you're doing it through box and dropbox you've got some larger issues to work with you know how right. do you know that they're doing their security practices appropriately like you might check them well do you follow the SOC 2 or high trust or any of these other possible yeah. mechanisms but you've got to have a process to trust your third party right now right. if you're talking about large organizations it's usually high trust these days a lot of them use soft 2 type 2 but you know that's like a compliance framework and the problem with compliance frameworks a lot of them are old and they don't include things unless you want to include it yeah. <clears throat> depending on the framework and there's some exceptions there but you know maybe you don't have dlp hipaa doesn't require a data loss prevention tool per se but it is a fantastic way to protect yourself from that data just going outbound. Totally. So let's say you use it in Office 365. And so the data is up in Office 365. Mm -hmm. You share it out to somebody else. If you permit that in your organization, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all of a sudden that data is going to somebody else. You may not know it. Was, were the, was the account compromised? Was something else going on? Yeah. <clears throat> right now, there's just so many challenges and strategies that organizations have to use to protect themselves from a small data perspective or an unstructured data it becomes a nightmare and, and that's where security professionals have to use lots you need a lot of different people it isn't just hey we got one thing on a server got everything on a server and just a couple of cases of data possibly getting lost right that's nothing to me it's everything else that's going on because you don't want to end up on the wall of shame from right. it. also by the way a real problem you run into yeah is that in many situations uh to try to sell a certain application to uh, the C-suite or to the board, uh, they might go for that, but try telling them you want to spend $2 million on a security system to worry about this, and they're going to throw you out of the room. <laughs> well, show them how they can possibly wind up paying triple that if they don't, right? They, I, I've been through this, sadly, too many times. <laughs> a very, That's very a serious problem. Oh God, um, that's a nice segue until the net into the next question. Um, yes. So, how can cybersecurity professionals learn new strategies to develop better? I guess, like, what are the key things that they need to have under their belt? And then we'll get into some more talks about um, uh, the personnel. But any thoughts about how can cybersecurity personnel? Uh, professionals learn new strategies to develop better besides going through a nightmare. Like what's what's the best way to prepare right. for this role? Victoria. Right. Well, 
first and foremost, you know, it's about taking 100% responsibility to develop those relationships. And, right. you know, if you are, let's say, a newly promoted executive, uh, or if you have, you know, not really mastered the whole thing about relationships and how important it is, uh, then it's going to feel messy. It's going to completely feel uncomfortable uh, because, you know, if, if you have an introverted personality, like I do, I, I know some people may not believe that now because no, I do no. like to talk. <laughs> not but, at all. Uh, I had to, <laughs> yeah, I, had, <laughs> I, no, I, I can't, yeah. I can't be, but I, I really am. I just, I, I just had to, learn to become extroverted when, you know, with my sales career after college, because I couldn't have been an introvert. So I had to learn the strategies. I went through the same thing that I teach people today. Um, but what I find is, you know, when they are resistant, you know, when they're feeling resistant to develop relationships, you know, they might be saying to themselves, oh, but that per person going to get to know me, you know, all these, th these things that we have in our head, uh, then just by taking 100% responsibility, working maybe with a coach, having a plan is very, very important and sticking to that plan. So yeah. that if, you know, if you are, uh, if you have a plan to be checking in, you know, uh, different methods of communication or whatever, you have to don't think, you know, uh, that it's, don't think that it's necessarily going to be easy. I mean, I know if you have people like Ron and Matt, you know, you might feel like more compelled to, to develop the relationship because they have an open door policy, right? Well, but, mm -hmm. but, you know, you have to navigate, yeah. right. You have to navigate the way and you'll find when you test different strategies, like, you know, like maybe, maybe the person, maybe the executive Victoria, you're breaking up a little bit. Yeah. I don't know if others. Yeah. You're looking to build a relationship with the best. Maybe, okay. maybe they prefer medium. And and I would definitely encourage, you know, do your research mm -hmm. on, you know, what they like, their sports teams. I know it sounds very basic, like 101, but it's some place to start and then and you can, you know, find those common interests, you know, when you're in your, in their office, you can look around and see, you know, there's so much nowadays to talk about. Uh, and most importantly, I feel it's, you know, to know them as a person so that you can relate, you know, human to human. Uh, and then that relationship will continue to build. The other thing is that I think is very important, and I've been doing this since before, you know, before we had uh, technology, and I really forced myself to have a discussion with them to find out what they wanted to do in their, in, you know, in their career or their next level up. And I used this strategy when I was first starting in sales. And I would literally know I, as I was calling on companies, because a lot of times it was cold calling in person. So when I was calling on companies, I would make it a point to get to know what, the, you know, what the goals were for from the president all the way to mm -hmm. the receptionist at the front door. And right. I was subtle about it, but I, because I knew that uh, the receptionist was very, very key to me getting anywhere in the company. And uh, so, you know, I, I may have to, you know, sometimes I would call on them maybe three times before they would even tell me who the name of the person was or, you know, let me set an appointment. But when I was able to get to know what they wanted to do, you know, what were they there temporarily or were they looking to move up? Then I, st then I would try to do what I could to help them uh, so that, uh, you know, like by putting in a good word for them or, Totally. you know, making sure I could give them resources. So, welcome. yes. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Uh, definitely great advice for anybody going into any role. I mean, definitely relationships are key. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, when folks want to get into healthcare executive management, I usually say, well, you definitely have to join American College of Healthcare Executives, okay? Because 
that organization really blew open doors for me. And really, how did it do that? It gave me a way to network with folks um, who are, <clears throat> excuse me, on the same path and folks who are, have in all walks of life, who can mm -hmm. give you advice and you just opportunities for constant learning and education. What is that organization for cybersecurity professionals? Um, what's the key association that you could tap into? Is it HIMSS? Primarily, um, Ron, what do you think? Like a, a I, professional I, association? I, I kind of feel, yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a member of uh, HIMSS. I mm -hmm. also was in the um, American College of Healthcare Executives. Uh, but I look at stuff that is, that's more localized to the, the, the place you're in. Yeah. Because it, it's very critical. And one of the most important things that gets stuff done Number one, first of all, people have to like you. That's number one. If they don't like you, you have a big problem, right? Right away. All right. That's number one. Number two, what's well, also wait a minute. Can't they not like you, but still respect you and you can still get work uh, done? Not usually. Oh, okay. <laughs> not in the real world. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but what's actually very important with uh, you know, with a lot of this stuff is that I found that when you work with some of the the executives and I've worked with you know all of them, all different types. And one thing I would tell you is that when they believe that you understand their world, right? Mm -hmm. And you are not just the IT person. Because right. if you're an IT person, they think you're somebody that has three heads, right? <laughs> they don't get it. All right. You're you're yeah. in a different dimension. Yeah. All right. But um fortunately for me in my career, my first five years in healthcare was not in IT. So I worked running admission screening centers. I worked in admitting, I worked in mm -hmm. finance, I worked in all these things. So now all this stuff was second nature to me. So when they would come up for a discussion and they were talking to the IT guy now, um, they didn't expect me to actually understand what they were doing because a lot of IT people don't, all right? Uh, yeah. In a hospital. But uh, my experience was very good in that I could relate to them on their level in their, in their specific field. And when they saw that, mm -hmm. and it also to believe me more that, well, maybe, maybe he doesn't. Right. Well, that's that building that relationship thing, yes. right? And it's establishing your credibility and uh, yeah. trustworthiness yeah. and all of that. Yeah. I mean, no, I constantly. Saying, it's totally right. It's like, yeah. that's. It's critical, absolutely critical. Yeah, I mean, I constantly get called an IT person and I say, I'm not IT, I'm data. Okay, it's right. very different. I'm data You're analytics. You're just T, no one. I'm, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not IT, I'm just T, you right. know, but it's <laughs> basically, I'm data analytics. I'm really not interested in, in understanding the infrastructure and, and, you know, all of the different parts, you know, of the machine, you know. I'm interested in working with the data that comes out. Um, and my CISOs that I know and love, uh, Matt, and you know, you guys are in my group of those I love. I lean on you um, to understand what are the different mechanisms we should have in place. Um, some of it, a lot of it is common sense, you know, but if you don't have it structured and communicated and documented and followed, you know, it gets lost. Um, so what you guys were talking about, the professionals, is a good segue into the next question. Okay, I believe, Victoria, you brought this one to light during the pre-talk. How do you conduct those difficult discussions between technology and executive departments? Um, so that was exactly what you were just talking about, Ron, with being yeah. the liaison. You know, yeah. um, do we want to talk about that a little bit? How do you conduct mm -hmm. those difficult discussions, you know, between those two groups? Right. Yeah, basically speaking different languages. Well, right. I'll just say right. briefly and, and then give it to Vicky. Oh, oh go Vicky, ahead. you go. Mm -hmm. Ron? Uh, well, no, I was no, just no, gonna go say, ahead. I, I was just going to say that, that you have to break down the wall that exists between IT and everybody else. That right. That is a critical item. And I'm sure, you know, Victoria has a lot of ways of dealing with that. I know I've certainly had to deal with that my whole career. You yeah. have to break that wall because IT, it's not like when we sat around, even as a chief information officer and a vice president, sitting in the room with other vice presidents who was, you know, we're all on the same level, 
And basically, though, the IT guy was always the guy out in left field. <laughs> so he, he was different, right? And breaking that wall was really important. But right. when you broke that wall, that's when stuff got done. And I'm sure uh, Vicky can talk about this because she uh, she works with this all the time. So yes. off to you, Vicky. Well, thanks. Well, so I came up with three different scenarios uh, so that, you know, we could just, you know, get engagement on specific issues. Mm -hmm. uh, these have been some scenarios that uh, some people that I've worked with have actually experienced. Uh, so I thought it would be here too from, you know, from uh, the CISO perspective, as well as, you know, from the data perspective, T. But the first, well, first, let, I just want to say, you know, difficult, difficult discussions are not easy, you know, whether it's at work or it's at home or wherever it is, right? But the point is that it's our responsibility to be proactive mm -hmm. and understand that uh, our role is going to come with difficult discussions, whether it's about, you know, firing someone, whether it's about disciplinary action, or whatever the case is. But the three scenarios that I came up with, and we don't have to do all three of them. I, I just wanted to throw them out there. Uh, the first one was what happens when, you know, you're in the CIO role or CISO role and you, you have, a, you miss the budget. So then you have to go have a difficult discussion with the CFO. The second one, and I have some strategies for these, but I wanted to throw them out there to see if you wanted to help. And the second one is explaining a system outage without knowing the root cause yet. Mm. So, you know, that's, that's obviously, uh, you know, some best practices that can be identified. Because uh, one thing I will say is that I, when we, when our back is up against the wall, so to speak, you know, sometimes uh, a newly promoted uh, executive may feel that they have to bombard people with details or they have to answer all the emails or the phone calls right away. And that's not necessarily the case. It's just about, you know, whatever the process is, there has to be a plan, obviously, and a process. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but being proactive and knowing the impact on the business, the impact on any customers, on patients, whatever the case is, that helps for sure. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then of course, not guessing, not guessing what the root cause is. I know we might be tempted to do these things, you know, um, because we, we, you know, when we have acronyms, I know when I was with at and I, you know, my friends would say I talked in a different language, but that's because I didn't, I didn't, I really wasn't aware of it. I thought, I, you know, it was every day thing for me. So I'm sure you can relate to that. And then yeah. the third uh, scenario I had was, was I don't, you know, being able to give like a snapshot review to a new CEO on a current IT strategy. So those were, those were the three scenarios that I picked out. So I know you wanted to choose one of those yeah. and then we can all kind of weigh in on it. I will Actually, ask my other two uh, participants here. I uh, I kind of like that first strategy she was talking about because there's a lot of real, when it comes to like working with the CFO, that's the hardest one you're going to deal with. As far as I'm concerned, the rest Money of the guy. people, they're totally, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you can work with them. The CFO, on the other hand, is a different, you know, subject altogether. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. my experience with the CFO is that basically... Uh, they seem to forget sometimes that the IT department is in the business of giving them what they asked for. So what they used to do many times when they sat there and was arguing about a budget, I would just say, uh, excuse me, I don't care. <laughs> you don't, if you don't want to do this, don't. I go, but you're the one that asked me to give you an OR system. So if you don't want to pay for it, I'm good. I have plenty to do. I used to tell them, I have enough work to last 30 years. I said, I don't care whether you do this or not. I yeah. have no dog in the race, <laughs> right? So if you don't want to do it and you don't want to spend the money, then don't. Just explain it to the surgeons who asked for it. 
uh -huh. and we're done. That's the other group. Right. Yeah. <laughs> People Just actually argue with doing them. the work. Yeah. You're not going to yeah. argue with me over something that you asked for, for somebody else that has nothing to do with me. I'm the guy that executes what you ordered. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that's how it works. And that's how I've turned many minds around. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I also mm -hmm. took the confrontation to another arena and let them fight amongst themselves. And I say, <laughs> call me when you're done. <laughs> it's like, because I don't care. <laughs> okay. I like that strategy. <laughs> yeah. I like that strategy, Ron. Taking things <laughs> in a little bit different direction. Cybersecurity is in a little bit different boat than IT. Yes. Um, IT is, you know, you're getting things done, you're building things, you're doing things, you're doing a fantastic right. job. Typically, when you, especially when you look at the older generation mm -hmm. and you look at how cybersecurity has evolved, cybersecurity originally is part of IT. It's got your firewall and your antivirus. Hey, we're good. You know, we're off to the races. <laughs> but today, that's not true. No. Cybersecurity is a complete entire discipline that goes yeah. behind it that is very different than IT. Mm -hmm. So the type of discussion I would have with the CFO is very different. But for me, it's all about trying to get everybody together. So a lot of Victoria's points about trust and building trust, you know, I like to use sources, you know, you cite your sources. You may disagree with the source, but tell me a better source that's better. You know, I brought up the Verizon DBIR because it's got the most data in it. You might find some source that's a little bit different. Great, let's pull that in and add that into your assessment. Mm -hmm. um, I like getting the data. I do agree that you have to go through and get everybody communicating. When it comes to the, up to the CFO, though, the discussion I like to have is risk. You know, or doing a risk assessment, making mm -hmm. sure people are aware of the risk and then creating the right level of accountability. So let's say a CFO doesn't want to pay for a firewall. They want to get something that's uh, really cheap over mm -hmm. something that's more expensive. Great. Here's the risk. You want to sign up. Are you accountable? You know, and creating that accountability within accountability. an organization is yeah. absolutely critical. So firewall, that's an IT task to go ahead and build it, put it in place. But what happens is in, in organizations and why a lot of the cybersecurity processes that are built over the years, you take a look at high trust. You know, they have um, policy, procedure, implemented, measured, managed, and measured is all about having somebody separate from the group that's actually doing the work. So mm -hmm. IT does mm -hmm. the implementation, but who's reviewing the configurations on that firewall? Who's reviewing the, what's called something called an access control list, which is another type of configuration. Mm -hmm. That should be a separated group. And right. larger organizations have learned that over painful years, and they realize this is absolutely critical. What's hey, man. To get a new CEO in there may not understand all this. Oh, this is just a waste. That's man, the yeah, challenge that, for security. Ron? That, that is just great because what I used to do with that in many cases was I learned a long time ago that in most organizations, an expert is anyone that comes from 100 miles away. So <laughs> what I did was <laughs> right, the they, they, may, right, they may not believe you and I, Matt, but yep. they will believe somebody from 100 miles away. So what I would do is whatever we had approved, all I would do is find the best company that was selling whatever it was and ask them to come in and talk and let them argue with those guys. <laughs> and I just sit back and go, yeah, this is what you're supposed to do. But, you know, uh, go by what they're saying, because, you know, a lot of people believe IBM, right? A lot of people believe these big companies. Uh, so it's pretty funny, actually, because that's exactly what you have to do, it, 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 it makes everything. sense. And this is like from an audit perspective, you get the outside people. You can uh -huh. say the exact same message right. as what they're saying, but all of a sudden it's like, they said, it, and it's a whole new ball game for them. Right. It, it completely <laughs> changes minds. And I think that's kind of the fun part of that. Yes. <laughs> seeing, even though you're saying the same thing, you know the same story, you've been through this a million times, somebody says the same thing, and all of a sudden the light bulb goes off and it's a completely right. different world that you're living in. So, totally. Right. I totally back so, you. Yeah, <laughs> great points. I love the discussion. I mean, for me, when I think, okay, well, what the heck is required for securing uh, small data you know, or data in general? But small data is my first love. So it seems to be like primarily it's about the people, right? And then the people and their processes. Yes, we have the technology. I love your people processes and technology. Um, a doctor where I am used to always say that and state that I love that I'm always it's quoting everywhere. Yeah. yeah, I'm quoting him on that. I put that on on PowerPoints that I've done um, and gave him full credit 
Um, but the people and the processes in terms of data nowadays and small data, there's a new role that he has emerged, which I would love to be one one day. And it's a CDO, Chief Data yeah. Officer. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So joining the C-suite and wouldn't, wouldn't this person or this role be responsible for the data governance um, processes um, alongside with the CISO, alongside with the CIO, alongside with all the Cs, but this person is really in charge of that setting the, 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 the sources, being clear about the sources of the data and all of those processes. What do you guys mm -hmm. think about the CDO role that's emerging? Love it. I think mm -hmm. that's yeah. really yeah. critical because when right. you start to look at all the moving parts related yeah. to data governance, Mm -hmm. You got to take a look at your contracts and HIPAA is making, I mean, sorry, like uh, privacy is making a completely new approach to mm -hmm. how you're going to handle things. So you take, um, there's the people most familiar with the CCPA, the California Consumer Protection Act, and that one is good, but now there's CPRA as well. And mm -hmm. that's taking HIPAA and throw it on its side. So, okay. Hey, you've got to understand what's going on. Cause what happens in that, um, if you have HIPAA data and you anonymize it, it's all of a sudden not HIPAA data. So you can take a big data source, usually try to associate with that person what's going on as a result mm -hmm. of that. In all, in all essence, it's now HIPAA data, but it's not because it didn't come from a covered entity. So right. that's what the distinction is. When you take okay. out CPRA and you re-identify that data by using big data, it all of a sudden becomes HIPAA data, but only for California residents. So okay. when you look at things, it's really confusing. You need to you need yeah. your privacy officer to be part of that. You also, need to take a look at all of those changes. There's like 30 plus or more uh, privacy regulations that are changing and growing throughout the United States today. Like and then this, you look right? At GDPRA, you take mm -hmm. the Brazil's got theirs. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many different types of privacy regulations. Mm -hmm. You really yeah. need to have lawyers that are pretty familiar with everything. Mm -hmm. You need to understand the technology, the contracts. Mm -hmm. All this stuff is part of the big picture of what you're yeah. looking at in today's world if you want to get into right. what is data. I mean, it's going to totally. depend on who you're talking to. Even the definition of a breach changes depending on the state that you're in. So right. Those things get complicated when you look totally. at the big picture here. Okay. By the way, what's Ron, interesting, what uh, Tate, what's very yeah. interesting what, and what, you know, when it comes to that, I also held the role of Chief Privacy Officer and Chief Security Officer and Sometimes I was three chiefs in one. Uh, but basically, one of the things that happened all the time, and especially one of the things I experienced as a chief privacy officer, mm -hmm. was that most of the HIPAA violations all came from internally mm -hmm. within the employees because of a culture that's been in existence for the entire history of healthcare. It was not uncommon that if my friend was in the hospital and I know Mary Jane on the 10th floor, I just pick up the phone and go, Mary Jane, you know, how's tea today? And they go, yeah, she's fine. She's got this on the other thing. <laughs> and it was no big deal. This yeah. went on all the time. And then all of a sudden HIPAA comes along and it says, if you don't have a reason to even be <laughs> with this patient, you can't say that. anything. You right. can't talk about anything. So most of the problems that I had to deal with and the violations that I dealt with were almost always the employees, all right? It no, wasn't totally. the other people. It was the employees all the time. Even though we had all the policies, <laughs> we told them you can't do this, but it was just natural. You'd call, like, if somebody, for example, a simple thing, someone from my department gets in an accident in the hospital, uh -huh. they take them to the emergency room. The normal thing that I did my entire career was to run to that emergency room. My, my, my employee and my friend is sitting in that ER now, uh, and I don't even know what happened, and I'm their boss. And, and so- Well, as me, long as you don't go to the EMR, ER, EMR and go, okay, let me just see what happened here. They don't, you know, even, want you a... going, not, <laughs> they don't even want you going into, they don't even want you going into the ER. Just stay away. You have no wow. business here. Yeah. It's very right, serious. So, so big cultural <laughs> thing. Yeah, no, totally. Like I said, thank you for uh, uh, um, emphasizing that. It's mostly about the people, the humans, and how we interact and what we're used to doing and what we're willing to change. So, you know, the mindset, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's a lot of what I've been hearing 
as I'm talking to all these folks across the globe, it's the mindset, the mindset. Um, we are almost close to time. Um, so before we close out, I want to check in with Daniela and see if there are any questions there. Daniela, do we have any questions that we'd like to pose to the group? Yes, we have yes. one question. Ooh. One second. Okay. Okay, much better. All yeah. right. So the question is, for anyone who is interested in being in IT, what skills are required to be a strategic and influential leader? Ooh. Who wants to take that one? I'll, I'll, I'll give that a shot. Okay. Um, to be an influential leader uh, and to get into this kind of field, it's it's having, first of all, an open-mindedness and a, a decisive nature, a take-charge nature. Mm -hmm. It's someone that has to understand that they kind of have to listen to all the things that are going on, but at the end of the day, they hold the responsibility of what's happening and they have to take that responsibility and, and, and they have to run what they, what they believe is correct. And sometimes that's very difficult for people because I've been in situations where sometimes my entire senior staff is telling me not to do something or to do something. And I knew just from my experience and, and what they're paying me for, it was the wrong idea. And I would just tell them, no, we're not doing that. And then they come back like a month or two later and they tell me, how the heck did you know that? All right. Well, you have to have the ability to stand up to these people. You have to have the ability to listen and pay attention. And, you know, everybody gets treated well. You, you've mm -hmm. got you've to treat people well. Uh, and you have to have a mutual respect. Mm -hmm. But everybody has to understand their place on the team. And that's a very important thing. People seem to think that a team is some kind of democracy. That's not true. A team has a leader. It has, you know, and if you look at any sports team, mm -hmm. you'll immediately see, and I'm not even into sports, but I can tell you that the quarterback runs that offense mm -hmm. next to the coach telling them what to do. <laughs> and, <laughs> and basically it, it kind of works like that. So I, I think that if you're, uh, and in the IT world, obviously logic is very important. All right, the uh, the ability to be logical um, and decisive. Mm -hmm. Decisive is very important, mm -hmm. and nice that would it. help people a lot. Thank you. Sure. So we're right almost at time. I just want to thank the three of you very much for joining me today, and kind of give Victoria and Matt an opportunity to say some last words in closing. Uh, before we end the evening, any words of wisdom or mic drop comments you'd like to leave the group with before we close out? Victoria, we'll start with you. Sure. I would just say to just with an open mind, always looking to for ways to be proactive, mm -hmm. you know, so that if you if you if you identify the, a missed budget, you know, I Obviously, the CFO would rather hear it from you than finding it out, you know, finding out on his own and then or her own and having to come to you. So mm -hmm. I think that that just, you know, making sure that we're looking for ways to be proactive uh, and always be the one seeking the solution versus uh, part of a problem. Right. Proactive versus reactive. Thank you. Um, Matt? Mm -hmm. From my perspective, it's all about communication, you know, and making the right communication at the right level. You know, a lot of organizations are sometimes in a little bit of disarray, but make sure that you've got, like for me, I like, uh, you know, risk management, but then there's enterprise risk management, which is above mm -hmm. that. How do they play into one another? You're bringing mm -hmm. people in. So, I mean, I like uh, Harvard Business Review. Um, the four key pillars that I look at are diversity, inclusion, engagement, and support. You know, you can't have, uh, you know, engagement across the entire organization. Like you can't have the democracy, but one level up and one level down for the engagement right. is great. You know, doing sanity checks, like validating what's going on in the cultural perspective are important. But do you have an IT steering committee? Do you have a privacy steering committee? Do you have a yeah. data governance committee? Uh, do you have a security risk committee? Do you have mm -hmm. all these kind of committees? Is that information going up to the board of directors? 
So you've got to take a look at everything very holistically and make sure that you communicate and communicate effectively because if you're not communicating, you're not going to go anywhere. Awesome. Mic drop. Boom. Ron, any, uh, any final comments before we close out for the evening? Yeah, I would just say that success in this world is about your passion to get the job done. And I always felt, I, I was in the healthcare business for one main reason, to take care of the patients. And that yeah. was the goal. And, and that passion is what drove me for everything. And right. when you stay and keep that in mind and never mm -hmm. forget who your real customer is, it's the guy in the bed, yeah. the woman in the bed. It's not oh, yeah. the seat suite. It's not the board. <laughs> it's the guy that's lying in the bed. It's so. the end customer. Her right. Customer. Love that. Mic right. drop. Okay. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Guys, I really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, to the attendees, thank you so much for registering and joining us this evening. Uh, to subscribe to the podcast, you can find us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, tune in. You can also go to www.eima-inc.com and click on Let's Talk Small Baby with me. And I hope to see you next time. Have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. This episode is brought to you by Effective Information Management specializing in healthcare small data and offering expertise that goes beyond technology. Visit www.eima-inc.com to learn more about Emma and the podcast, Let's Talk Small Data with Tina.